Shem Hashem Naseh Benetzliach, Shiur Torah, Bukhim Abayim. We are uh, back on our Wednesday night, Stop the Rabbi, where after a little bit of Divrei Torah, you guys will ask some questions, and uh, Bezot Hashem HaKadosh Baruch will give us uh, the answers. Uh, tonight's show will be for Refuah Shlema, for Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Avi Mori David Ben Nesriah, Doris Bat Jora, uh, Orit Bat Ilana, Sarah Bat Sausan, uh, and also for a Atzlacha Rabah for uh, Marsha Bat Juli, uh, Ayla Bat Marsha, uh, Samuel Ben Marsha, Se- uh, Sefas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, Shaul Ben Farzane, uh, Itro Ben Avraham, Oshri Ben Doris, Gabi Ben Doris, Elad Ben Doris, David Ben Esriya, Amir Ben Shahin, and all of Am Yisrael Bezot Hashem will have a Refuah Shlema, Atzlacha Rabah, Bekom Maasi Adem, uh, to all of those that uh, continue to support in uh, every way, shape. Uh, so uh, for uh, those of you that have gotten your packages, please, uh, you know, with all of the uh, key roof store material, please send some pictures uh, of some happy faces that are getting uh, the books and the uh, CDs and all the other wonderful things uh, that you got. Uh, this uh, in itself could uh, actually help people do chuba because if you show how excited you are and how excited people are to uh, to get the material to uh, to help them do chuba surely that's going to encourage more people to uh, to sign up and get material for themselves for anybody that wants to uh, to get it um, get some stuff to give out in their community in the United States go to uh, our website kiruvstore.org kiruv k i r u v store s t o r e dot org and you can order some stuff for free. We even pay for the shipping. Of course, everybody that has the financial ability, please, uh, you know, donate. Uh, aside from that, also a very big update, Baruch Hashem. Anybody that's uh, watching from, uh, watching me right now from the app, uh, you're seeing that there is a major, major update in the app. Extraordinary update. There's all types of wonderful new tools. Uh, of course, you can watch the lecture uh, live, uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, many other new tools on the app, uh, and also for anybody that wants to watch the uh, lecture live, uh, you can go to uh, bh dot uh, live uh, to watch the lectures live uh, and avoid going to uh, you know Facebook or anywhere else. Or there's also another new website that, in essence, houses all of the websites, whether it's bezratashem.org or chibutakever.org or tikkun or uh, the uh, the BH Live. Go to bhtorah.org. Go to bhtorah.org. B as in bezrat, H as in Hashem, Torah, T-O-R-A-H, dot org. That's the new uh, website, Bo Hashem. It's uh, in essence houses everything. So wherever you want to go, you just go there and you just press the button, and it'll take you to whichever one of the websites that you want to go. Watch things live. Watch one of the movies. Bo Hashem, our uh, team is uh, just getting uh, more and more siyata dishmaya to uh, to help more and more people do tshuva. Bo Hashem. Uh, so with that being said, uh, Bo Hashem, we uh, placed the order for another ten thousand copies. Of the uh, the book, uh, the uh, the reviews, the uh, the feedback we're getting, Baruch Hashem from Eretz Yisrael has been amazing. Still waiting for some feedback from uh, from the U.S. since people just got their books over the last couple of weeks. But a few people that were really zealous started reading it and are uh, setting pictures of smiling faces. So Baruch Hashem, if anybody didn't get any, any one of the books in the United States or Israel, please let us know. Some of the some of you that are contacting us or even placing orders. Uh, on the uh, website, but you're located in different places around the country. Uh, you're, uh, you know, you're simply wasting time because, as we said on the post itself, right now we're focusing on the U.S. and, of course, we have some stuff in Israel. Later on, Bezal Hashem, if uh, Hashem allows, we'll also do other countries. But uh, the the cost of shipping is extraordinary to ship anything overseas, uh, even shipping in the U.S. The average package is uh, costing a ton of money just to ship it without uh, even calculating the cost of material. So anybody that wants to, uh, really, really wants it to, uh, to come to, I don't know, whatever country they want to go to, if you're willing to pay for, uh, for the shipping, which is probably going to be at least several hundred dollars, uh, I'm more than happy to do it. It's just that we have to do things within budget, and at the same token, 
uh, the budget in itself is already something that uh, is above and beyond what we thought was going to be. So with that being said, uh, let's uh, get into the shiur. We have, Baruch Hashem, uh, Parashat Vayichi, Vayichi Yaakov, Beretz Mitzrayim, Shvay Esre Shana. So Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. Uh, Yaakov Avinu lived 147 years in this, uh, in this world. And uh, those, most of those years were atrocious years, full of difficulty, uh, full of uh, suffering, uh, whether it was a, uh, the uh, uh, life-threatening battles that he had with, uh, with Esav, his brother, or living in the house of uh, the biggest criminal in history, Lavan, Lavan Arami, uh, or it was uh, simply fighting for the sake of his wives, or losing uh, his uh, son for 22 years, uh, Yosef. Uh, lots and lots of suffering in the life of, uh, of uh, Yaakov. But the uh, Torah says that the last 17 years were the best years of his life, which in essence means that everything that's happening here, Yaakov obviously is uh, uh, giving uh, the blessings, uh, making the statements under a, uh, a very uh, uh, clear mind, uh, because the Gemara says that uh, if somebody is in pain, we don't, uh, they don't judge him in Shemaim uh, for doing certain things, meaning the, judging, the judgment is... Uh, is lessened uh, as there was one of the sages that was in uh, massive pain and another person a, another a uh, uh, you know Jewish uh, student uh, thought that uh, it was wise to uh, to play a game with him and uh, the sage uh, you know didn't find it funny at all because it was the, the game itself was causing him pain in essence he was getting in his way when he wanted to go to the bathroom uh, and uh, relieve some of the pain, and uh, this uh, this young man did not think that uh, you know uh, his uh, game was crossing the line, and the sage you know sage in essence cursed him, and the person died on the spot. Uh, and uh, the Gemara says that uh, just like a, uh, uh, this, just like the uh, uh, Job that uh, said some things that could borderline be considered heretical uh, before he did tshuva. Uh, Hashem did not judge him as harshly as he would judge somebody that would be under, uh, you know, uh, normal conditions. Job was under an immense amount of pain, to say the least. Uh, just like the the sage was under immense amount of pain, and anybody that is in a immense amount of pain and suffering is not judged the same way. It doesn't mean that they're not judged; they're not allowed to just simply violate the entire Torah. But in essence, it's it's already known in the Torah. It's already uh, uh, taught by the sages that uh, when a person is uh, suffering, obviously this can cloud your judgment. This can uh, shorten your temper and so on. But this was not the case with Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu has just had the 17 best years of his life, which means that the rebuke that he is giving his children. Uh, is uh, is actually the, uh, the the best of the best. Uh, it's not coming chas v'shalom from a place of, uh, of of suffering. It's not coming from a, plain, a place of uh, discontent. It's not coming from hatred chas v'shalom. It's not coming from any place that is inappropriate. But rather, this these rebukes are actually some of the best blessings that a person could ever get if they would simply understand what it is to get a rebuke from a Talmit Chacham. Uh, and just like it was in the previous generation when one of the young men that was the uh, grandson of one of the G'dolei Ado, uh, you know, got rebuked for something he didn't do. When his uh, friend told him, why didn't you tell your grandfather that uh, you didn't do it? You just sat there and, re- and accepted the rebuke and he just ripped you apart. Why didn't you tell him you didn't do it? I know you didn't do it. You were with me. The grandson said to, uh, to his friend, you're right, I didn't do it. But when am I ever going to get another chance to get such a beautiful rebuke from one of the greatest sages in history? When am I going to get another chance? Meaning that when a person understands what the value is of a Talmud Chacham and thereby understand the value of a real rebuke, uh, a person would actually look forward to it, even though it hurts. Even though it is uh, not, never fun to get rebuked. Nobody likes to be told what to do. 
But nonetheless, we see that the rebuke from Yaakov was words of love for his, uh, for his children and his descendants until this day. Now, in the beginning, we see a, uh, a little bit of a test, a test here of where our minds are, of course, through the, uh, the words of Yaakov to his son, where Yaakov asks his son for a, uh, you know, for a promise to uh, not bury him in Egypt. As it says, uh, you know, um, Please, if I have found favor in your eyes, please place your hand under my thigh and do kindness and truth with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt. So first and foremost, we see a few things that are unusual. The first thing is that he asks Yosef to put his hand under his thigh. If you did that in today's world, you would be considered a, uh, a pedophile, a, a molester, or something like that. But that's because the world is full of filthy people that have filthy minds. Uh, now, the Yaakov Avinu was the uh, Reshit Ba'avot, the uh, head of the Avot, even though he was the grandson of Avraham. He was uh, something... Uh, uh, the closest to a perfect human being you can possibly get. And uh, Yaakov understood the holiness of the Brit, just like he learned from his grandfather, Avram Avinu, when he made Eliezer, his, uh, his servant, swear to him before going on a trip to find a kala for his son, Yitzchak. He said, put your hand under my thigh, meaning put your hand under my Brit. Why? because it was customary in those days to hold the most valuable possession that you have while you are making a promise, while you're making a swear. And Avraham Avinu, the most valuable thing that he had was his brit, because that was the covenant between him and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The same goes with his grandson, Yaakov Avinu, the, understands the value of the brit and mentions it uh, other times in this parasha, where he says, Put your hand under my brit and swear. This is the most valuable thing that I have. In essence, I'm putting everything on the line here. Now, of course, when a person sees something like this, or they see different things in the Gemara, if they even have the merit to study Gemara, and they see all types of statements and Midrashim uh, that uh, talk about the, uh, the Erva, which is the male member, uh, different things, stories of how Hashem punished, for example, Nebuchadnezzar, a, uh, who was a uh, uh, homosexual rapist that raped all of the kings out there. And when he wanted to uh, to to rape one of the holy Jewish kings, uh, Hashem uh, punished him by making his erva uh, really, really uh, long uh, to the point of uh, of of, uh, of disaster and. Uh, uh, you know, agony and pain. Uh, other times, there are other places in the Torah that talk about the erva of a uh, of different sages. Now, of course, if people will say, "What is, what is this, a porn, uh, pornography in the Gemara? In the Torah, is pornography?" No, that just simply means you have pornography in your head. That's all that means. It means you have pornography and filth in your head. If that's what you think. So, what does it actually mean? Does it mean literally? Yeah, it means literally, but it's but it's actually not supposed to be understood the way you understand it why because if a person has a clean mind and does not think of all the filth that's in the world he understands the value of the breed he understands that something holy a holy person like avraham does not see a difference between his finger and his uh and his breed as far as a piece of the body but as far as a piece of holiness, he sees it as the most valuable possession that he has in the entire world. Because that is in essence what's going to determine whether he will be holy and build a holy home or not. Because he can learn Torah and still be a filthy person. He can say nice things and still be a filthy person. He can help a lot of people and still be a filthy person and have no share of the world to come. Why? The Brit is the foundation of the Jew. And even more so, even the non-Jews are obligated to a certain extent to not be adulterers and, and, and wasting seed and things of that nature. As we saw 
in Eren Onan, before even Judaism began, before Matan Torah, were killed by Hashem at a very young age because they wasted seed. We saw that the generation of Noah was destroyed because they wasted seed, because they were homosexuals, because they not only accepted the immorality in the world, but actually rationalized and legalized it, similar to how people are doing it today. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Kedoshim tiyu ki kedosh ani. You be holy because I am holy. And the way that Am Yisrael sanctifies themselves and makes themselves holy is in the way that they treat and look at what the Brit is. A holy Jew does not look at their Brit. When I say look at their Brit, I mean in perspective. I mean in perspective in a sense that how do you view it? Is this a tool to serve Hashem or is this a tool to serve yourself if you are looking at yourself in the mirror or every time you have to go to the bathroom you have to make sure that all the parts are there then you my dear friend are very far away from holiness you're very far away from holiness and it's time to make that change why because there's no reason to check if your male parts are there there's no reason to check if your female parts are there why if they weren't you would know but we have gotten accustomed to the point of allowing filth into our minds unbeknownst to us that it's even filth and thereby when people learn different lectures about tikkun abrit and uh, the issues of immorality it's a shock to their entire spiritual immune system because they never viewed things from that perspective so it's very important to understand that when the sages when the torah itself mentions the issues of the brit of the covenant of the uh, of the issues of the male or female parts they're not talking about it in a filthy disgusting minded of today's society but rather in a torah perspective where this particular part of the body is in essence the determining factor of whether someone will ever become a holy person or not and whether that seed will be a seed that will produce holiness or it's going to be a seed that's going to produce demons the choice is ours the key is to understand that when Yaakov Avinu is telling his son to put his hand there that's because they understand that this is the most valuable connection they have to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and this is what distinguishes them from the Canaanites the Canaanites were also people the Canaanites also had needs the Canaanites also put their uh, uh, clothes on and put their clothes off and and breathe and they're people just like everybody says why what's the difference between the Jewish people and the rest of the people why are they chosen this is the reason why they're chosen when a Jew wants to sanctify themselves there is nothing greater in the world than that such a Jew why because that is a distinguishing factor that the the nations do not have such policies and even if you say yeah but some of the other uh, religions also say that you shouldn't do it yes they say that you shouldn't do it while they say to allow things that are much much worse so to understand what the sanctity is of of the Brit is to understand what the foundation of the Torah is now after this we see that this whole uh, uh, discussion is in itself putting us to question what's going on here why because Yaakov is in essence telling his son Yosef Ben Porat Yosef Ben Porat Ali Ayn the Yosef was so righteous so beautiful both spiritually and physically that when he gets the blessing he gets the most extensive blessing out of all the brothers but yet Yaakov makes him swear why does he have to make him swear why not just tell him listen don't bury me in Egypt the end or just do me a favor don't bury me in Egypt why does he have to not only make him swear but make him swear with in essence everything on the line because Yaakov is in essence telling his son Yosef I know that the other brothers will also want to do my will but you're the only one that has a position of power that can actually fulfill it the second thing is that you have to understand is that you're going to have a lot of uh opportunities to not listen to me one of those things is that paro paro who is an idol worshiper with a nation full of idol worshipers they're going to try to turn me into a place of uh of idolatry they're going to try to pray to me and they're going to tell you no no you can't bury 
your father outside of Egypt. You have to bury him here. Since he came to Egypt, the, the, uh, the famine ended. Instead of lasting seven years, it only lasted two years. Your father is a blessing. But since he came here, every time Paro co- goes to the Nile River, the Nile River, in essence, bows to him. You know, obviously, Yaakov is a very, very special person. We don't want his body to be anywhere else. We want to pray to him. We want to go uh, uh, sit next to him. We want to draw him. We're going to do everything with him. So, of course, Paro is not going to want it. So that's why you have to swear. Why do you have to swear? How is swearing? What is a uh, uh, Paro care about uh, the Jewish people making any swears? What does he abide by the Torah? No. Paro abides by his own interest. And the Midrash tells us, and it's also in the Gemara, that when Yosef HaTzadik was in the prison the night before, the night before Paro called him up, while in essence, uh, while Paro was having those dreams, Malach Gavriel came to Yosef and taught him 70 languages. In one night, in essence, in one instance, he taught him 70 languages. Now, although Yosef was a genius tzaddik beforehand, now he got to a completely different level. Why do I need to know 70 languages? Now, everybody that was in part of the Sanhedrin also had to know 70 languages, but they had a lot more than just one night to learn them. Yosef had a matter of a few hours. You have to know all the languages. Why? Tomorrow, Paro is going to call you, and after you interpret his dream, he's going to see whether... He can prove to the others that you are fit to be a viceroy because the Egyptians hate the Hebrews. In fact, they hate the Hebrews, they hate shepherds, and there's no way in the world that they would submit to the laws of somebody that they feel is disgusting. So we have to prove that you fit. How do we have to prove? The way that the kingdom was was, uh, 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 selected in, uh, in Egypt at the time, was based on the knowledge of languages. Whoever knew the most amount of languages was king. Paro knew 69 languages. And the, uh, the way that they signified this in the kingdom of Paro is that there were, si- there were 70 steps. There were 70 steps to the throne of Paro. And in essence, Paro was 69 of them he fulfilled. And every time that uh, uh, he spoke to Yosef, he said something in a different language. And Yosef had to answer him in that language to prove that he speaks that language. And each time he would go up another step, and another step, and another step. But after he got the 69 languages, which is the maximum that Paro knew, then Yosef said it and responded in Hebrew, a language that Paro himself did not know, which in essence meant that technically Yosef was supposed to become king, not viceroy. But since only Paro heard this, Paro made Yosef swear. Swear that you're not going to tell anybody else that you know one more language than me. Swear to me. And Yosef swore to him that he's not going to do it. So now Yaakov, who was a prophet, tells Yosef, when Paro comes to you and he tells you, don't take your father out of here, we need his holy body in Egypt, what's better than Egypt? We'll build him a whole pyramid. Yosef says, no, I swore to my father. And he's going to tell you, okay, you swore to your father, but I'm still king. And you have to answer him, yes, you're right, you are king, but of course, if I cancel my swear to my father, that means that I have to cancel all of my swears including the one that i made to you years ago when we had that little discussion on the 70th step and at that moment paro understood that he had no choice that's the reason behind the swear now the interesting thing that i saw today is that yosef doesn't really ask his father, why are you making me swear? In essence, Yosef hears his father's request and simply says, That's it. I'll do as you say. No 
questions asked, no discussion, no, why do you want me to do this? Why are you making me swear? Why are we doing this whole bleed thing? Why you, Why don't you bring the other brothers? No questions by Yosef. Why isn't Yosef asking questions? Because we know that whoever is a chacham, whoever is smart, it's, it's shown by their questions, not by their uh, uh, their answers, but rather by their questions. The, uh, the chachamim that would hear good questions would take time answering those questions. And it was one chacham that heard a question from somebody that was in the name of one of the sages from the previous generation. And he said, Rav, do you know the answer? And the Rav says, to him, hold on a second. Let me enjoy this for a while. Enjoy what? The question from one of the Gedolei Ado from the previous generation. You just brought me a question. That's what I'm enjoying, not the answer. Yeah, I give you an answer, but that's not as much fun as look at the mind of a Talmud Chacham. Enjoying the question. Questions are determined, determine a person's intellect. They see where and how that person thinks. Most people think that if you have all the information, perhaps that would, that's what makes you smart. Not necessarily could it makes you prepared. Perhaps you could prepare yourself for things and you can answer questions or you simply have the gift of gab and you could just talk your way out of any hole even if what you're saying is wrong it sounds right because you have confidence answering questions does not determine whether a person's smart or not what kind of questions they ask that's a different story now of course answering questions is critical if you answer the questions correctly but sometimes people are so focused on on looking good they forget what they're even doing like the joke that uh, I, I said once before, but I think it's worth saying again, that there was one guy that uh, was a complete idiot, but pretended to be smart. And uh, he says to listen, I, I, think, I think I get the job. I'm, I'm better than everybody else you have. I don't understand. How do you think? Why do you think that you're better than everybody I have, Blaine? Do you know all of the people that I have? I don't need to know. I know everything about everything. Ask me anything you want. So a guy says, okay, uh, listen, since uh, we deal with a lot of mathematical issues and so on, what is the, uh, let's see if you know basic math. I don't know, what's uh, 5 times 5? 17. No, 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 ask me another one, ask me another one. Okay, uh, 10 times 10, 3. No, no, oh, no, no, come on, ask another one, ask another one, ask another one. Okay, what's 1 plus 7? 37. Hold on a second. You just said that you're smarter than everybody else that I have here. I have physicists here. I have astrologers here. I have people that, you know, are mathematical geniuses here. You can't even figure first grade math. What makes you think you're better than everybody else? Just forget about that. You're focusing too much on the answers. Did you notice how fast I can answer you? That's an idiot. But unfortunately, the world is, is full of such people. The world is full of such people that are too focused on looking good rather than whether their content actually makes any sense typically this is one of the habits of the heretics that are always unprepared but unfortunately always look like they know what they're talking about hence the reason why they uh they succeed in causing people to sin but if you double check their answers you double check their sources nine out of ten times you'll see that it's completely off completely wrong and the one time that it's right typically it's not because they knew it but rather because they uh simply it's the one bit of information they do know and they simply decide to put that piece of the puzzle in the uh, first place that they saw now here we see that Yaakov Avinu is asking Yosef a very big question a very big agreement and Yosef does not have much questions here as smart as he is he's not asking much questions showing that Yosef in this particular instance has shown his emunat chachamim blindly blind faith in the chacham blind faith in the chacham unfortunately today this is nowhere to be found many people say that they believe in the Torah but they separate the Torah from its sages they believe that if there's not a explanation that they understand simply that means that nobody knows or perhaps that everybody's wrong except themselves and when a rabbi tells them something if they don't like the answer they'll just ask another one there's very little emunat chachamim 
We spoke about it yesterday in the uh, shiur about what's happening uh, in, in the world as a result of, uh, of people falling for the trap of the Satan. They're also showing uh, their lack of emunah in Chachamim. And thereby, everyone has become an advocate for one side or the other. Some are pushing the vaccine as the cure of all diseases, and some are pushing the anti-vaccine as if this is the angel of death himself. This is outright poison, and everyone's going to take it. It's going to have AIDS, and it's going to have uh, uh, you know problems giving birth, and so on and so forth. All types of other crazy types of things. Now, of course, you have people that have heard the words of some of the Chachamim and say, okay, I'm going to listen to the Chacham that says, take it. Or others that say, I'm going to listen to the Chacham that says, don't take it. Fine. But then there are people that they decide whatever they want to do and they decide to fight whoever disagrees with them, even if that is a Chacham. So much so that they threatened the lives of, of many rabbis, including Rav Kanievsky Sheikhye, are torturing many other rabbis, showing up to their lectures, insulting them, distracting them, uh, all types of insults on the internet. Literally, the, the, the sewer that was inside their bodies just being vomited day and night without a stoppage. And I've seen with my own eyes people that consider themselves righteous turn into vicious monsters when it comes to speaking about rabbis that are tell me the chachamim that are righteous people but yet disagree with their opinion about what to do with this coronavirus vaccine and you see both men and women fall in this trap part of the reason of why these people have fallen is because they don't actually have any emunah in chachamim i had one guy that thinks of himself as a chacham that no, no, if it's not Moshe Rabbeinu, then we don't have to, uh, or Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, then we don't have to listen to it. Even though the Gemara says that every generation has the Moshe Rabbeinu, every, uh, the Chachamim of the generation are, uh, are, are what you listen to, you don't need to wait for Moshe Rabbeinu, and there's obviously an endless amount of instructions from the Torah itself, from the Oral Torah, from the Rin Torah, from the Shulchan Aruch, from the uh, Rishonim, Achonim, but no, no, all of that is in the garbage because this rabbi, however big he is, he's an idiot. Why? Because he disagrees with my opinion about what to do with the vaccine. Unfortunately, Rabotai, this is a tragedy like no other that we've seen in ris- recent history. In my opinion, this could turn into something much, much worse than the Holocaust if it hasn't already because at least the Holocaust killed bodies and the righteous people still went to heaven. But here you have people killing their neshamot. And before this whole thing happened, there were like 50-50 decent people, some even very good people that had a share of the world to come. But they simply decided to throw that share of the world to come in the garbage as soon as they heard that some big rabbi disagrees with their opinion. And unfortunately, this, ha- this is a result of lack of emunat chachamim. Of course, lack of yirat shamayim, but that lack of yirat shamayim uh, lack of fear of heaven leads to lack of emunah in the Chachamim, faith in the sages, where you understand that the sages are saying to you what the Torah is saying. They're not saying something out of their own mind. They're not saying something for any uh, uh, benefit of some kind. But of course, the uh, the people that disagree, they'll not only uh, uh, mistreat the sages, but they'll literally act just like the Rishayim of the, of the uh, when we were 40 years in a desert that accused Moshe Rabbeinu of the worst, most heinous crimes in the world, where they literally say, now, this rabbi is pushing the, uh, the vaccine because Pfizer is probably paying him off. He's probably getting paid off for every lecture that he's pushing the vaccine. He's probably getting a few cents into his non-profit organization. All types of mumbo-jumbo conspiracy garbage. And literally, you, you, you ask yourself, how do these people have enough brain power to put their pants on one leg at a time? How do they have their brain power to take a spoon and feed themselves? They literally should be instituted. But nonetheless, these people are walking among us and there are literally hundreds of millions of them and unfortunately many millions of them are actually jews now the issue here is that you have opinions on both sides from great chachamim you have people you have chachamim that say 
take the vaccine you have Chachamim that say don't take the vaccine so which one do you listen to we have said it time and time again that regardless of which side you want to go with as long as you're doing it because the Chacham said it you have something to rely on there's another way to put it that I heard from my Rav, Rav Ephraim it's simply a story about one of the G'dolei Ado from the previous generation Rav Tzion Abba Shaul Rav Tzion Abba Shaul was one of the giants of the generation was the Chavruta of Rav Ovadi Yosef and of course he understood that there are certain people in the world that are simply wicked now Rav Tzion Abba Shaul was an extraordinary posek a Talmit Chacham a Ish Emet and uh he gave one time he gave a shield there's a lot of people there and in that shiur showed up one guy religious guy and he asks the chacham a question what does he ask the chacham a question rabbi what's the what's the halacha when it comes to such and such issue now you would think what's the problem of asking what's the halacha of the such and such issue what's the problem this is really what the rabbi is there for no no why because everyone in that room hundreds of people knew that that week that week there was another Talmud Chacham that was a serious person that came out with a psak came out with a sefer published a sefer with a psak halacha about a specific matter that was the opposite of what Rav Tzion Abba Shaul himself published so in essence what is he doing he's putting Rav Tzion Abba Shaul on the spot to what go to war with this other chacham why because some people they look religious they have a beard they have a hat they even uh, will go you know have a strimal they even call themselves rabbi all types of things but sometimes all they want is not torah they want fights they want fights since they're not allowed to fight to, to watch fights on uh, on television they're not allowed to fight in the streets they're not allowed to do that stuff so what do they do they like to watch rabbis fight that's their that's their favorite not fight for the valid reason where you're trying to protect the Torah but rather fight because they like machloket so Rav Tzion Abba Shaul that was an extraordinary Chacham knew what's going on in a matter of a half a second and he answers this person in front of everybody he says well it comes to this particular Allah some people can do such and such and they have somebody to rely on meaning this other Chacham and some people can do something else the other thing the other opposite and they also have somebody to rely on meaning himself and the people that agree with him but you have nobody to rely on why because you like machloket you like fights there are certain people literally they never ask me any questions but what do they send me non-stop did you see what such and such did maybe maybe uh we should uh do something about it what you think i do this for fun go call out people just because i want to get views or something like people are sick they're sick they're looking for something that somebody did wrong even if nobody in the world knows who this person is and nobody in the world even agrees that this is wrong but they'll come to me why they want me to be the police or they themselves do it oh listen rabbi I saw that this guy in some country he made a a, 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 a a YouTube video and he said everything such and such and such and such and such but there was a picture in the background with his wife on it so I had to call him out so I made a whole post uh, 87 lines with uh, 6,000 words uh, explaining to this guy how wrong he is for making such a video I did good right Rabbi Bitul Torah that's what you did Bitul Torah but unfortunately Rabotai, some people like machloket they like fights they like action and unfortunately this is part of the people that at times like to watch some of our lectures but usually they fall off at some point or another and they end up turning us into their enemy when they realize that the rebuke that we have against specific people is for the sake of the Torah not for the sake of our honor and eventually when a person listens to enough shurim they realize that the rebuke also pertains to them and if they're not looking for the truth then they'll obviously take it personally and they'll turn us into Amalek into Haman into Nebuchadnezzar into Hitler into whoever you want but we become enemy number one why because they weren't looking for the truth 
reality is, Rabotai Karim, if you're going to rebuke people, you better check yourself first. Do you have an interest? What's the purpose behind your rebuke? Who are you trying to help? Yourself or somebody else? And it's a very, very tough question at times if a person does not really know how to, how to check himself. But either way, we have here the whole situation with Yaakov Avinu and Yosef. And Yaakov Avinu is putting Yosef to the test. Do you have Emunat Chachamim? I'm asking you a question. I'm asking you to make a promise. Yosef does not ask any questions. Why? He has Emunat Chachamim. In another place, later on, we see that you're allowed to ask questions. You're allowed to ask questions. Where we see it? We see that when Yaakov gives the blessing to the sons of, uh, of uh, Yosef, he does something that is not viewed favorably by Yosef. When he puts his hands on the sons, on the heads of the sons of Yosef, Ephraim and Menashe, he crisscrosses his hands where he puts his right hand on the younger son and his left hand on the older son, in essence, meaning that the bigger blessing goes to the younger son and the smaller blessing goes to the older son. And uh, Yosef, Yosef looks at it in a uh, displeasing way. And he says, uh, uh, that this is uh, not so, Father, for this is the firstborn. Meaning he thought that his father was making a mistake. But Yaakov corrects him and says, yadati bni yadati. I know, my son, I know. Meaning it's okay, you're allowed to ask questions. But are you asking questions because you're questioning whether I know what I'm doing or I made a mistake, where is the question stemming from? And this is really what makes all the difference. You're always allowed to ask questions. That's in essence one of the primary purposes of having a rabbi. You're able to ask questions, get guidance and so on. But sometimes you give certain people advice and they don't like your advice, but they are shy to tell you that they don't like it. So what do they do? They ask you the same exact question with different words. They ask you the same question with different words. Or better yet, they say to you, listen, I know you said such and such, but Rabbi such and such said differently. Can you explain why he said what he said? Why do I need to explain why somebody else said what they said? I know what I said and I know why I said it. Why do I need to explain why somebody else said it? Why don't you go ask him? Why don't you go ask them? Why do I need to explain it? The truth is, why do you come to me with questions if you don't trust what I say? And many times it's because the audience, the students, are certain that this rabbi is smart, but not as smart as them. They always believe that, yeah, he's smart in a lot of things, but this particular question, I think I know more than him. This particular issue, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. He knows a lot. He, don't get me wrong. He's a big tzaddik. And they say, listen, he's a great person. He's a tzaddik. He does good things. He's amazing. I can't say enough. But in this particular issue, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. Or, let me say it in a nice way, I think he doesn't know all the facts. And this is, in essence, the argument that many people use to justify their evil nature when they speak against Chachamim in regards to this Corona vaccine and so on. Like, yeah, yeah he's a G'dola doll, but only up to a limit. When it comes to this, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not a doctor, but you're a doctor. You're a doctor. You're a diagnostician. You are a bio biologist. You are a chemist. You are a NASA uh, astronaut too. You're everything. But the G'dola doll, he doesn't know. You know. Unfortunately, Rabotai, this issue is not a new issue. It's called lack of emunah in chachamim, lack of faith in the sages, which really means that the person himself does not believe in the Torah itself. You say, no, what do you mean? I believe in the Torah. I know all the proofs. No, no. Part of the Torah is to understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives the Torah to those that toil and toil over it. And you are not allowed to go right or left against their words. Part of believing in the Torah Part of believing in the Torah is to have emunah in the chachamim. And a person says, yeah, but 
I believe in other things, but not this. Okay, so you're a uh, heretic in regards to this particular mitzvah. It's a very serious problem. Why? Because without emunat chachamim, you really cannot move in any particular direction with actual certainty. Because you don't really know if what you're doing is right. Unless one of the chachamim says what you're doing is right. Wow, but don't I have my own mind? Yes, you do have your own mind. But your own mind is not always going to get you to the right direction. The Chacham has the Torah as his mind. Why? Because he is deciding based on what the Torah says. His understanding of the Torah, which is 100% siyata dishmaya, divine assistance. The more he is responsible for more people, the more he'll have siyata dishmaya. If he's just a Chacham that's by himself and doesn't interact with anybody else, He's not going to have the same level of siyat dishmai. This is why I always tell different avachim that we work with and different people that I know, the best gift that they can give themselves is to start helping people learn Torah and do tshuva. Why? Because since you obviously an avrech, you're learning all day, you're learning all night, you love the Torah, that means that you, you would appreciate to get more Torah. The greatest way to get more Torah is if a Kadosh Baruch Hu decides that you are a vessel he wants to put in more Torah. What would make Hashem decide such a thing? Isn't just studying Torah enough to convince Hashem to give you Torah? No. There are a lot of people that study Torah, but they don't uh, get to the uh, shoelace of some other Chachamim. Why? Because a Kadosh Baruch Hu will give you the Torah that you need, give you the Torah that you deserve. If your needs are individual needs, if your uh, merits are your own individual merits, then you have a certain portion allotted to you. But if you help other people do tshuva, if you teach the public to do, you know, Torah, the more you help people get closer to Hashem, the more their merits become part of yours. In essence, meaning when HaKadosh Baruch Hu does the accounting of who should I give more Torah to, more knowledge, more clarity. The one that's gonna, gonna take responsibility for a hundred people, a thousand people, ten thousand people, or somebody that just wants to write books for himself and perhaps for his family, and but really just wants to be alone. Who am I gonna give it to? Surely it's gonna be to the person that is responsible for more people, even if that person studies less than some of the others he'll end up getting a lot more. Why? Because when HaKadosh Baruch Hu does the accounting, he sees that here you have 100,000 people that need Torah from this vessel. Here you have 10 people that need Torah from this vessel. So the calculation is based on the people. Based on the people. And that's why people that end up doing very serious uh, teaching, kiruv, and things of that nature, they get a much higher level of siyat Yishmaya in their Torah learning than average people. But nonetheless... The average person out there cannot really relate to this particular issue, but perhaps they can relate to the next part. You see, when a person understands what Torah is, understands what Siyat Dishmai is, divine assistance is, understands what a Talmit Chacham is, needless to say, a Gdol Adol, they don't have many questions about what the Gadol says. They have questions about something the Gadol hasn't talked about. Meaning, he'll go ask the Gadol, he'll go ask his rabbi, what do I need to do with ABC? Where do I need to go to get ABC? What do you think of ABC? Whatever the issue is. But if the rabbi says, go here, go there, do this, do that, generally speaking, they're not going to ask many questions. Why? If he's really a Talmud Chacham, then surely he thought of the questions that I have. And when he answered the question, when he answered my, my question, he took that into consideration. What are some examples of this? Rav Shvadron, Alava Shalom, was not only a very big Kiruv Rabbi, but was also a Gaon Batorah. Gaon, Gaon, something out of this world. If he wasn't so active in helping people do tshuva, helping people get closer to Hashem, constantly teaching everywhere, 
there'll be no doubt in my mind that he himself would be considered literally one of the G'dole Ador, not just in the world of Kiruv and helping people and Zikri Rabim, but also literally in, in, in every other aspect. Of course, he's considered a giant, but I'm talking about he would be considered even more than what he was. Despite all of this, despite how much of a genius and committed he was to the Torah, never taking a penny for a single lecture, never fighting, never fighting over the issues of money, never chasing money, just focusing on Torah, focusing on getting people to see the truth, telling them the truth to their face. The level of emunah that he had in Chachamim was literally unsurpassed. In his bio, which a fantastic book, highly recommended for anybody, you read a lot of stories about him, but some of the most fascinating stories about are his interactions between him and his and, and big rabbis, all types of big rabbis. He was connected to the top of the top, the Stipe Gaon, his son Rav Kanievsky, uh, Rav Levinstein. Uh, I mean, uh, everybody. Uh, the the uh, Chazonish. I mean, it's literally every gadol was. I, uh, someone that not only knew him but respected him and it was amazing one time he uh, we're talking about something like 25 30 years ago 40 years ago even he uh, wanted to go ask a Sheila from Rav Kanievsky Rav Kanievsky was already known as a extraordinary Chacham but not in the same extent as he is today obviously many years have passed he wanted to ask a Sheila from Rav Kanievsky. And when he got there, he saw that there's a line of people waiting to see Rav Kanievsky. So he waited online. Everybody understood that Rav Shpadon is there. He's like, no, no, Chacham, you go. What are you standing online? We're regular people. You. Rav Shpadon says, no, Rav I'm standing online just like you guys. Why, why would a Chas Shalom? I would never cut. The people couldn't uh, deal with this. Somebody, somebody whispered to the family, look, Rav Spadon is here, he's waiting for the Rav. He's waiting for Rav Kanievsky. So immediately, Rav Kanievsky heard this. He himself got out of his chair, came out, says, come, come, come. He goes, no, no, for the Rav, he's in the back of the line. No, no, Rabbi, I'm waiting on line like everybody else. He says, no, Chas Shalom, you wait like everybody else. You come right away. And he literally had to convince them to come and see him. That's how much honor he had for the Gdullah Do. Why? Why should I deserve more of his time than anybody else? Also, a kavod for the Briot, the Briot, the, the rest of the people. They were there. Another story is that uh, his son says, his son uh, uh, tells a story that when he was four years old, he had a uh, dangerously, uh, a dangerous cough, a dangerous uh, uh, health situation the uh the cough was at a point where the doctors really didn't know what to do no one knew what to do but it was a very very serious cough so Rav Spadron took his son to the chasonish took his son to the chasonish to ask the chacham for some advice and a bracha chasonish here's what Rav Spadron is saying Within a, without skipping a beat or getting confused, he says to Rav Spadron, go to the uh, Yarkon. Go to the Yarkon. Over there, in that, uh, in that, uh, near the river, near the, near the water, there are eucalyptus trees. And because there's eucalyptus trees there, there's special air that's going to help the boy breathe. Rosh Padron, without getting confused, takes his four-year-old son, and they go, and they go and find themselves a boat that they can start rowing without any experience or knowledge how to row boats. And they're on the river. And the son, who himself became a very big chacham, says the whole time my father is struggling with the river struggling with figuring out how to boat and how to row he keeps repeating himself over and over again to listen to the words of the chachamim 
to listen to the words of the Chachamim. To listen to the words of the Chachamim. For a half hour, he's rowing the boat, just repeating, listening to the words of the Chachamim. Eventually, they get to the other side after a half hour of rowing. And uh, they ask a person that was there uh, to help them get onto the uh, get onto the bank. And uh, they asked him if he knows the area specific where we're looking for, uh, uh, you know, for eucalyptus trees. And the person said, yeah, yeah, you can go this particular direction. So they started walking a little bit through a bunch of different trees. And the four-year-old son, suddenly the cough comes down. Within one hour, within one hour, he was cured. The little boy says to Rav Shpadron, his father, Abba, Baruch Hashem, that there is the Yarkon cured us. Rav Shpadron says, no, no, no. What value does the Yarkon have? What value does the Yarkon have apart from the blessing of the Chazonish. It's not the Yarkon that cured us. It's that Akadosh Baruch Hu listened to the blessing of the Chazonish. That's why. You see, Rabotai, when a person has a Munai and a Chacham, they don't ask, why do I need to go to a river? Can I get a pill instead? Maybe there's something else easier, Rabbi? Those questions never come up. Why? If you have emunah and chacham, you already put into ca- calculation that he already thought of this. Another time when Rav Spadron was supposed to go on one of his long trips, he went to Rabbi Cheskel Levinstein, the Mashkiach of Ponovich, for a blessing. But what happened is that two weeks before that, there was a Brit Milah for one of the grandsons of uh, Rav Spadron, and Rav Spadron couldn't go because he didn't feel well. And Rav Yechezke Levenstein went and he asked, where's, uh, where's the grandfather? Where's uh, Rav Spadron? He said, no, no, he, uh, he doesn't feel well. So when Rav Spadron came to Rav Yechezke Levenstein, and told him, listen, Kvod Rav, I want you to uh, give me a blessing before I go on this trip. Rav Levinsky says to him, yes, but you, you, your legs, did you say you, you couldn't come to the Brit Milah? Immediately, Rav Spadon said, okay. He turned around, went back to his house. The whole house is full of luggages. He tells his wife, the trip is canceled. Why? It's canceled. What do you mean? But the, the boat will go. You're supposed to go right away. It's, it's in a few hours. It's canceled. Why is it canceled though? Because Rabbi Cheskel Levinstein said it's canceled. He said, don't go. He said that I'm not healthy to go. Well, tell me what he said. Well, I went to Rabbi Cheskel Levinstein to ask for a blessing. And he said to me, but your legs... Now, of course, Rabbi Cheske Levinstein knows that already a couple of weeks have passed since my legs were hurting me, but yet he still felt the need to tell me that my legs, that means I'm not going. Any question that I have is irrelevant because surely he already took it into account. He canceled the trip. We're not talking about a trip that's easy to make like today. You just go on the internet, press a couple of buttons, and you're on a plane five minutes later. We're not talking about a trip that's easy to make where you make a few phone calls, they set you up lectures, and you have a bunch of places to go to. We're not talking about an easy trip where it's easy to pay and these people are swimming in money. We're talking about a major loss, a major hardship, without a question. Why? Rabbi Cheske Levinstein, Talmit Chacham, said no. That's it. Yeah, but he didn't say no. 
He said no. Why? He already said, how could I be going if my legs hurt? Two weeks ago. Surely he knows what he's talking about. And as you would have it, Rabbi Shvadon not going, as a result of that, many, many things happened that were favorable to him that wouldn't have happened in any other way. It wouldn't have happened in any other way if he would have went. Why? Listening to the Chachamim. So we see here, Rabotai, this letter, this book is full, full of uh, stories about Rav Shpadron and other Chachamim. The, this particular book is called The Voice of Truth. Highly recommended. I always recommend for you guys to read the bios of Chachamim because you'll understand how Hashem truly runs the world much better if you read the stories of the lives of the Chachamim than if you look at things from your own perspective. And the beautiful thing here is that we see that on one way, in one, uh, one particular instance, Yaakov does not ask any questions. Why do you need me to swear? Why is, do I have to touch the breed? Why? What's all of this stuff about? There's no question. Why? Surely if you're asking me to swear, you thought about it. You thought about it. On the other hand, surely if this particular issue is asked and you gave me an answer your answer did not include everything that i thought of at that moment but later on i had some new thoughts that's only because i had those thoughts doesn't mean that you didn't have those thoughts just because i had a new thought three days later that i didn't mention in my question doesn't mean that you didn't think of it also at the time that you answered the question but the problem is when we compare the Chachamim to ourselves, we also compare our own limitations to the Chachamim. We figure that since we just discovered something new or looked at things in a new way, that perhaps when they gave us the answer, they didn't realize what we just discovered. Which means we don't really have a Munat Chachamim. And many times this leads to a life of struggle because you cannot live a single day without having more doubts in your life and anxiety because no answer from any chacham will ever satiate you there was one time a uh, woman came to me and said listen i uh have all these difficulties such and such and i gave her some guidance mainly she should do tshuva keep shabbat become modest and so on and so forth time passed she didn't listen our life got worse she came back she said listen can you tell me some new uh, you know some something about what's going on i need to talk to a kabbalist i said about what it's about my problems did you do everything that i said no 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 i need to talk to a kabbalist i said yeah but the kabbalist is not really going to change anything you, you still have, regardless of, of who what when and how you still have to keep shabbat keep this keep that and most importantly be modest can you just get me a Kabbalist? A little while later, I sent her a message. I said, wow, Pele Plaim, wonder of wonders. The answer was the same. You have to do tshuva, become modest, observe Shabbat, and so on. She says, wow, he's so right. I really need to do it. Thank you no questions asked why she had a munat chachamim and a kabbalah she didn't know and baruch hashem it helped her life amevin yavin you see rabotai karim sometimes you have to give people an answer with a lot of details sometimes you have to give people an answer with little details it doesn't depend on their level of intellect but rather on their level of trust in what you're saying if a person has a lot of trust in what you're saying you don't need to explain too much just tell them this is a b c one two three the end it's a person that doesn't trust what you say you have to try to train them try to help them try to guide them to get to that point where they understand that what you're saying is what the Torah is in essence guiding them to do and that's it 
but unfortunately this is never an easy job because sometimes you have to get to a point where you realize i give up i am not the vessel for you to ask questions you have to go to a different chacham you have to go to somebody else why but i have a lot of questions i know you have a lot of questions but you're not accepting the answers that i'm giving you and what ends up happening is that other people are suffering because of your questions why are other people suffering because that time could be spent as you know helping other people since you are not gonna you're not going to accept this chacham's answers anyway what's the point of asking the questions if it's purely for entertainment go smash your head against the wall a few times perhaps you'll be more entertained maybe even the chacham will be entertained when he hears what you did but the reality is there's no point of asking a question if you're not willing to accept the answer before you ask the question meaning if you're gonna go ask a chacham a question regardless of who it is you have to already take on to yourself whatever i get that's what i accept it's like god himself told me this answer if you're not ready to accept that don't ask the question why because you're only making your life more difficult you're only making your life more difficult and many times i try to break my head with certain people i go in i double check i double check with rubber frame anytime that i have something especially if it's a strong opinion about something or if it's a uh, if it's something that even if i have a one percent doubt i always double check always double check and when i give the information i tell him listen i double check this is what i thought and rather if i'm agreed or disagreed or whatever he said this is what the information is and the most frustrating thing in the world is when people go and send you on a goose chase you go get the information they get it and they simply say ah you know what i already asked somebody else and he told me something else so i'm just gonna go with that <laughs> one of the most frustrating things in the world why because it's simply a big waste of time unfortunately this is part of it you have to continue doing it regardless but the main thing is is if 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 we as as regular people are going to ask Kachamim questions really the onus is on, is on us to already accept the answer before we even got it in fact accept the answer before we even ask the question that's how we know whether we have emunat chachamim or not if we're not able to do that it's better off for us not to ask the questions because if you're looking for an answer that agrees with your pre-existing mentality perhaps you can figure it out on your own already just like a lot of people have decided what they wanted to do with the vaccine one way or the other before they asked many chachamim they're just looking for somebody to agree with them and that's not the right approach that's that's approach is an approach that eventually will have a very very tough bump in the road to say the least but here we see that although a person is allowed to ask questions it's not because he has lack of emunah Yaakov Avinu put Yosef under the test told him to do something unusual Yosef had no questions but when he saw something else when he saw no this is not something unusual this is something that perhaps it's a mistake why because he has his hand crossed it's, a, it's something that you know it's, it's right there maybe he thinks that this son is the older one and this son is the younger one why because you know it's their kids he has many grandkids that's it that's why I'm asking the question perhaps this is something is going on perhaps the kid's going to be insulted maybe he could do it in a different way so you didn't like the way it was so you asked the question comes Yaakov Avinu and says to Yosef what does it mean I know I know why I know I know it looks weird but this is the way I got my blessing from my father Yitzchak my blessing was supposed to go to a sav but a kadosh bauchu made a switch and i got the blessing instead so just like i got the blessing from my father this way where everything was switched this is the way it needs to happen why because here you have two boys one of them the younger one is a gibor in the world of torah the other one is a gibal but in business in helping his father the younger one needs more blessing so how come i'm gonna give a blessing later on 
to your brother Issachar, that's a businessman, before I give the bracha to Zvulun, that is a Ben Torah, why? Shouldn't it be the same? No, it cannot be the same. Why? Because here we have two brothers, one is learning Torah, and one is a uh, is, is, is financing the Torah. So the one that's learning Torah is only succeeding in learning Torah with comfort because his brother is financing it. He's a Torah investor. He's a partner. So all of his Torah is thanks to his brother, hence the reason of why he deserves the blessing first. That's the reason why the brother deserves the blessing first, because he's the one that's financing it. Even though the one that's learning Torah is fantastic, is amazing, everything is great, but we have to understand that there is a priority list. If you're going to help somebody learn Torah, you're going to help somebody do Kiruv, you're going to help somebody do all the wonderful things that they do in the Torah world, then surely you're going to get a blessing. And the one mistake I made was that Zevulun. Zevulun is the one that financed the Torah. Issachar is the uh, one that learned Torah. So Zevulun is the one that got the blessing, even though he's financing the Torah. He learns Torah, but that's not his priority. His priority was to work, make money, and finance the Torah. Donate money. Give money to, to publicize, to build a kolel, to build a yeshiva, to build a synagogue, to, to uh, publicize more USBs and CDs and, and videos and so on. That was his priority. He gets the blessing first from Yaakov Avinu, from his father Yaakov. The one that learned Torah, he got the blessing after him. Because his Torah was in essence dependent on the investment of his brother. But in the case of uh, of the sons of Yosef, it was different. Why was it different? The one that learned Torah got the blessing first, not second. Why? Because he was being financed by his father. He was being financed by his father. His brother that was, a, in essence, helping his father wasn't uh, financing his brother. So, in essence, that's why the one that's learning Torah, he gets the blessing first. He gets the blessing first. So that's where we see how the, uh, uh, the Mishnah that uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, Gadola me'ase mina'ose, that uh, uh, it's uh, much more praiseworthy or much more uh, meritorious, I should say. Much more merit goes to the person that helps another do and fulfill a mitzvah than the one that actually does it. Meaning, if you help somebody do tshuva, you will get more reward than they do for what they're doing. They put on tefillin, you get a merit of, of them putting on tefillin. But the merit that you got is even bigger than what they're getting. You help somebody a, 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 a learn Torah, they are getting a mitzvah for every second that they're learning Torah. You are getting more. Why? You helped them. You helped them. So it's an extraordinary thing to help other people do good things, especially when it comes to the Torah world. Because the reward you're going to get for helping another person is greater than they're getting, and it's even greater than what you're getting for what you're doing yourself. Meaning, you helping another person do tshuva, and because you helped them do tshuva, they're going to keep Shabbat. So now you have three different merits every shabbat one merit you have for the shabbat that you keep one merit you have was for the shabbat that they kept right they they they, uh, they kept but the merit the bigger biggest part is that you're going to get the biggest part is going to be for what they're keeping why because you uh you help them keep it so you have three different in essence three different merits one they're getting for themselves one you're getting for yourself but then there's another merit, which is the one that you're getting for helping them do it. And that third merit, that's the biggest merit of all. That's the greatest of all. So here we see that the sons of Yaakov, the sons of, of Yosef, they were good people, tzaddikim, righteous. Yaakov says, they're like my sons. Why they're like my sons? Why didn't he make all of the other grandsons also like the tribes? He says, no, no. And also, the, another question is, why did Yaakov tell uh, Yosef that, uh, that the rest of the kids that are born to you after these two, after Ephraim and Asher, they're going to be to you. Meaning these two kids, they're special. They're becoming part of the tribes. They're like my kids. But the rest of the kids that you have, 
also the rest of the kids that your brothers have all of my other grandkids they're like yours these two are special why these two special why not the sons of Yehuda? one of them one of the sons of Yehuda, the mashiach comes from him so why not him being one of the tribes why not the sons uh, of the grandkids of of dan it was shimshona gibo he was a prophet why wasn't he one of the tribes why not anybody else why isn't the grandson of levi uh moshe rabenu one of the tribes how come just the famine and manashe Chachamim say it's important to know that Yaakov looked at things differently than we did. We look at things as we ask a lot of questions and we say, why this, why this, why that? Yaakov says, look, you're looking at everybody being equal. Oh, everybody has a son, so all grandsons are equal. Everybody has a son, all sons are equal. Everybody has a daughter, all daughters are equal. Yaakov doesn't look at that. He says, what is the essence of this boy? What is the essence? this this these children relevant to everybody else you see all of the other sons all of the other grandsons that I have are different why they grew up in my household they grew up in a Froom neighborhood so they didn't have the tests like a fireman menashe fireman menashe they grew up in uh, in Harlem they grew up in the projects they grew up among uh, idol worshipers they grew up in Cooper City. They grew up nowhere. Nothing to be found. Closest uh, store that has kosher food is 20 minutes away. Nothing. That's where they grew up. And they still were Talmi de Chachamim. They were still religious. They were still glued to Hashem. Why? Because they're like my sons. They have the strength of of Ruven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Issachar, Zvulun, Dan, Naftali, Asher, God, everybody. They're like this, they're, they're powerful people. If they could be righteous, from Yirat Shamaim, despite their neighborhood that's full of Avodah Zarah, these people are special. The rest of the grandkids that grew up in my household, I can't say that, they didn't have the same test. What about the other kids? What about the other kids of Yosef? Ah, you can't calculate that. Why? Because now we're all here. Your new kids, they're going to grow up in a Froom neighborhood just like the other grandkids. Nobody could ever be like Ephraim and Menashe. They were unique. They started the community before the community even knew that it was a community. So you see, Rabotai Karim, when Yaakov Avinu gives the blessing to these two, nobody asks a question, how come they got a blessing? Nobody asked the question, why did the Fremen Manasheh get a blessing? Because they know that the Chacham, the prophet, Yaakov Avinu, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. And the only thing that we need to do for ourselves is to figure out all of the other wonderful things that he already knew, just like that. And that's what we toil. We toil to figure out how the Chacham arrived at his opinion. Not how the Chacham is wrong, but how the Chacham arrived at his opinion. How the Chacham conclude what he said. Surely he's right. By default, he's right, we're wrong if we disagree. If a person looks at Talmidei Chachamim that way, their life will be much easier. Why? Because they already have a decision for everything that didn't happen before it happened. Because the Torah already has all decisions. But if a person is always going to want the Chacham to agree with what they think, they're never going to get the answers. No answer will ever be enough. Thank you.
שאלו מה לה מה לה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה. הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם לטובה ולברכה. שבכל מה שיפנו, יזכירו ויצליחו. יזכירו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה. הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. בעזרת השם רשת בכל הארץ. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. במיאמי. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. Thank you.